Okay, so I would like to start by recapping uh, what we did last time, which is uh, sparse recovery. So we are in the data stream model, and um, the setting is that we have a frequency vector x, right? It's of dimension n, n is huge, and each time you can update x, uh, like a given i and delta, you can update uh, the element i by value delta. Um, and what we want to do is this problem called sparse recovery. <clears throat> like we want to construct a sketch that is like a off size much less than n, just something like s. And um, if s, if x is s sparse, then you should be able to recover all entry of x from the sketch um, in just something like s time. And otherwise, if it's not as fast, then you should be able to report it. So we see completely how to solve this problem when s is 1. We just need like uh, three numbers, right? Just need to re maintain these three numbers. Um, and there is a very simple algorithm to, to check. Um, that is, to maintain these three numbers, you just give an update. You just update a view 1, 2, 3 in a simple way like this. And uh, given a query, you can just check the, like uh, some simple condition about the views one, two, and three. And if the condition is true, just return this, and this is going to be your unique non-zero entry. Otherwise, you can say that this is not one sparse. Good. And uh, to solve S sparse recovery, well, the idea is that you want to basically partition these n elements into s buckets, right? And if, if your stream is s sparse, then you hope that this s element, which is non-zero, should be partitioned uniquely into some buckets. No, no one collide. No, there's no collision. Like, each non-zero entry just uniquely go to one bucket, and no one else collide with it. And if that happens, then it's good. Like, uh, then the bucket that contains each element like, is one sparse, and uh, you can use one sparse recovery uh, to, to reco recover um, each element. So let me recap the algorithm, right? Um, so I call this for each, like, for each algorithm. It's not like uh, very good yet, but let's, let's see it. So we, we will basically start by sample a universal hash function, right? Um, so this hash function basically partition n elements into k buckets. This is what, what it do, what it does. And now, basically, what we maintain is that for each bucket, you will now um, <clears throat> maintain this xb. Right, which is the frequency vector of element in bucket B. Yeah. So just to be specific, right, when, when like given update i and delta, how do you do, what do you do? Well, what you do is that you just, instead of how, how, you, how do you maintain this thing for each B? What you do is just, you just look at X for this bucket, right? And update. Update the guy only. Right. Given an element I, just update the, buck, the stream for this bucket. And which is why you you just maintain this thing for all buckets. You can just do this. And for each of this stream xp, right, you just for each of this frequency vector xp, just use one sparse recovery on xp. Which means that if xp is one sparse, you you will get you can recover the element. Right? So so when now like what what's the algorithm to query? Well, when you when you want to recover S, like you want to query, you just look at all of all the buckets, right? And um, 
Well, we just report the, non the unique non-zero of XB if XB is one sparse. Right? So, so that's the algorithm. Um, and um, any question about the algorithm that we covered is last time, but if anything is not clear, which I want you to understand this. Okay. So, and we we saw yes last time that um, in this case, right? Um, if we denote s correct by the non-zero elements of x, we see that if x is s sparse, then you know that for each element, for each non-zero element, you will be able to recover it with 99%. This is just because you will fail to recover this i only if um, the bucket of i is not one sparse. <coughs> That's just when you fail to recover i. But that is just, that happens only when some other non-zero element j collide with i. Right? And each of these, like uh, the collision probability is one over k, and there are just as many as many uh, non-zero elements. So that's um, just by union bound, right? You just get s over k here, and that's one over, ten, one over 100. Okay. So, so this is kind of what we kind of got last time. That is, if, if x is as sparse, you will, be, you will be recover each non-zero element, non-zero entry with 99%. But we want to do like recover all of them in very high with, like with very high probability. So we need to deal with this thing. And if x is not as fast, then we need to report it. Okay. So okay. So let's try to try to like uh, deal with the first issue. So let's uh, let's still assume that x is as sparse, but now we want to report. Like, we want to deal with the first issue here. We want to recover all non-zero elements, not just, like, not just say that each element can be recovered with some 99% probability. So, okay. So this is an issue, right? Like, uh, we just show that for each i, for each non-zero element i, the bucket of i, is not one sparse with just one percent, and uh, if we just trivially use union bound, like we want to bound this, we want to say instead, instead that we want to say that the probability that the exists some i such that the bucket of i is not sparse. I want this to be small, and if we just just use union bound trivially, you would you would just get this thing, right? So that's that's meaningless. Right? Because as like this, this can be more than one. It doesn't say anything. So, and last time we we kind of talk about how to boost the probability um, from from one percent to be like much less than one percent. Uh, can anyone uh, tell me how did we do it? Yeah. Copy. Yeah, we we make copies. Good. So just make copies, right? So, so now, the for all algorithm. Now, it's just the same thing as we have before, except that just run so many copies of everything that we have before. So that's what we do. Just run C, co C copies of everything that I just brought before. And now, with this, we would get that the probability that we cannot recover some i, uh, like some, the re probability that we will not recover some i in all copies here is just this thing is not as sparse in all C copies. So that, that is going to be like this guy for each of the, this, there's going to be this stream for each version of the copies, right? 
and and we said that if this thing is not one sparse for all C copies, so that's gonna, just going to be at most one percent to the C. And if C is big enough, which is in our case, uh, oh, sorry, I should choose C to be just this thing. Mistake, typo here. Yeah. Yeah. C is log of S over log over delta. And if you choose C to be like that, then you would get that this is less than delta over S. Right. So now, if we if now you use union bound, the probability that the x is i in S correct, such that this thing is true. This is just going to be at most S times delta over S at most delta. You by union by union bound. So so I get this S because I S. Right now, I assume that the size of S correct is, is just at most S, right? We assume that X is S sparse. Okay. So, which means that we will miss some elements with probability like just, just at most data. So we are correct, correctly recover all of them in prob with high probability, like one minus delta. So let me conclude. Like if we set an S report, it just that it's just a set of everything that we report. Then the conclusion is that you see we can we're gonna report this set in time something like C times K. We have we have K C copies, and um, for each copy we run something like k copies of k, k many one sparse recovery. Right. This is just the number of copies. This is just the number of one sparse recovery for each copies. For each copy. And the time to the time for one sparse recovery is just constant. Right? Just so, so the time to report everything is just C times K. So that's like S times log of S over delta. And we also know that whatever we report, it's going to be correct. S report is a subset of S copy. We only report like non-zero element. But we also know that if indeed X is S sparse, these two sets must be the same with high probability. We just showed that. OK. So just how about the space analysis? There are C many copies. Each copy, you have K buckets. For each bucket, you use one sparse recovery. That is three numbers. So that's C times K times three. So this is just S log S over delta. And um, there, there are additional space from the hatching, right? Which is, uh, there are C copies. Each copy, you use one hash function. But universal hashing needs just like a constant numbers. So that's basically C many numbers that you need. OK. So in total, this is like the total number that you store. This, this thing subsume this thing. OK. So any question up to now? This is what we, we reco like, uh, covered last time. But before we continue, we need, I need to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So ask question now. So once one recovery needs three numbers, are those three numbers uh, those uh, that you compute W1, W2, W3? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. I, I will continue, all right. Okay, so yeah, this is what we get, right? If x is as fast, you report everything correctly with high probability. 
um, and the space that we need so far is small. So now what do we do when x is not as sparse? Right? We want to report that. If it is not as sparse, we want to report that correctly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a prime number. Okay. Think of this prime number as something like much bigger than n. Um, this prime number is, you can even think of it as like n to the 10 or delta, like something huge. Right. But it's just a number, like it just, to store this prime number, it just takes you like log of this thing, which is log n bits. So that's small. Okay, but think of it as some big prime number. And now I'm going to choose one random element. R and FP is just you would think of it as a set from zero to two p minus one, so it's a finite field of size p. So think of it as it's just some element in this thing, and when whenever we do arithmetic, we do mod p. Yeah, that's that's what finite field of size p is. So now what I'm gonna do is that I'm going to maintain two numbers, w3 and w3 tilde. Okay. So like I, I use, yeah. So don't get confused with w3 for one sparse recovery that we seen before. This is just new w3. But I used it because it will serve similar purpose, that is, W3 before, we used to sh use it to check if, if the vector is one sparse or not. Here we're going to use this W3, the new version of W3, to check if the vector is as sparse or not. Okay. So, okay. W3 is just defined to be this thing, right? Uh, a sum of xi r to the i. Another way to write this is just is sum over all non-zero elements such that and xi r to the i. Because the zero guys is not is not in the sum anyway. And everything mod p. Also, how about this? This is just um, yeah. Well. Instead of summing all all s correct, I sum over all s report instead. Okay. So what do we have about about this thing? Why why is this useful? So my claim is that first, this is clear. If s correct and s report are the same, then W3 and W3 tilde are the same. Because they sum over the same stuff. This, these two things are the same. So they are the same. But now, my claim is that if these two sets are not the same, then W3 and W3 tilde will not be the same with high probability. Right? So you see, like there are at least some chance that they are the same because we we sum over okay the the sum are on the different stuff, but whenever whenever you mod p, then they might be like the same thing after you after you do the modulo. There's some chance that they are the same, but I'm gonna say that okay, this is not gonna happen with very high probability. There. If the sum are not from the same stuff, these two numbers will not be the same with high probability. So that that sounds like uh, that sounds good, but let's see um, let's see this 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 why why this is the case first before we see why is it useful. So it's like this. How how to see this proof? Well, let let's define this. Polynomial a of z, right? A of z is just um, 
this thing. Maybe I better write this as um, I in S correct. Just this thing minus this thing. When when where Z here is is a variable, right? X I is X. This X R are numbers, right? But Z is a variable of of this polynomial. This is a polynomial over FP, so it's like everything mod P. So now you see that when whenever W3 and W3 tilde are the same, it's just the same thing as saying that these two, these two things are the same mod P, just the definition. But it's just the same thing. Uh, this when does this uh, equal? Well, this is when a evaluated at r becomes zero mod p, right? So, if you ask what is the probability that they are the same, they are equal. It's just asking what is the probability that when you choose r randomly and evaluate this polynomial A, then you evaluate it to be, and after evaluation, it becomes zero. That's what you ask. Okay. So, so now, let's compute that probability. Um, so, we claim that, so we have that this thing, Right, the probability that W three and W three tilde are the same is just the probability that A evaluated at a random R becomes zero mod P. So you should follow up to this point, and I claim that this thing should be small. This probability must be small. So why is that? This is because when S correct and S report are not the same, then if you look at polynomial A as a formal polynomial, they are not they are not zero polynomial. Right? It's not like all, all the variables are, are not they, they are not cancelling uh, each other. Right? Because because there are some i which is not in here, like there are some i which is in in s correct, which is not in here, and so like that that term will not be cancelling. So this polynomial is not a zero is not a zero polynomial, and moreover, it's a non-zero polynomial with degrees n. But you know that any polynomial with degree n have at, at most n roots. So, so this is just asking, okay, this polynomial have at most n roots. So there are just n elements in the field that this guy evaluated to zero. But how many elements that are, you, are sam, sam, you, you are sampling from? There are p of them. So the probability that like there are only n guys that evaluated to zero, but there are p of them. So the, this probability is n over p. Make sense? Why this is n over p? And you choose p to be big enough bigger than n over delta, so you should be to be big enough so that this is less, less than delta. Right? So, so what do we have so far? We have that if, now let me conclude. We, we have the following with high, high probability. If W3 and W3 tilde are the same, then we know with high probability that these two set must be the same. 
right? And if these two sets are the same, it means what? It means that x, x is as sparse if and only if s report is less than of size of has size less than s. Yeah. Question. Question for that probability, like uh, why a r equals zero mode p is is equivalent with like the a like a r equal to zero like n rules are the rules for a r equal to zero like for example for some r a r equals to p then it also mode p equal to zero so so this is so when I said that it has n root it it really means that it has n roots in 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 finite field so so already like uh, after mod p even after mod after you mod p there are still at most n many elements that that give you zero so so n root in fp because fp is a field and like uh, um, there are n root in this field that answer yours right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you doing that probability? Are you are you like assuming s correct is not s report? That there's something different. You say it again. Sorry. Or are you like assuming s correct is not equal to s report? Yeah. Here yeah, I assume that when this is not the same, then if they are not the same, then the probability that this thing are equal is very small. Okay. But if they are the same, then these two these two set like these two numbers must be the same. Okay. Well, if they were the same, then just these are a polynomial. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah, if if they are the same, then these two numbers are like the same by definition, or like is like this polynomial is zero, zero polynomial. But if they are not the same, then they must W3 and W3 theta are not the same with high probability. That's what we conclude so far. So basically you think like this event and this event happen together with high probability. So if this is the same, then this is the same with high probability, which means that if you want to check if X is as fast or not, just look at the size of S report. And if these two things are not the same, actually you know that x is not as sparse. Just by contrapositive, right? Like, let's say, let's, let me see, let's see why this is true. If x is as sparse, we know from the for all algorithm that we have seen last time, whenever your, your stream is as sparse, you will be able to report everything with high probability. So these are the same. But if these two sets are the same, then these two numbers are the same. Okay, let's put everything together. So the final algorithm is here, right? We maintain, first we just maintain whatever the sketch that you need from, from the for all algorithm. But in addition, you maintain W3 as well. Like, given, like, um, given an update that XI, like, given an update I delta, what you just need to do is update W3 by what? just by uh, r to the i, mod p. This is mod p. Uh, delta. And now when, when you query, when you want to know like um, whether the vector is as sparse or not, and if, if, if it, is, it is, you want to report everything. So when you query, just first compute S report using the for all algorithm. The for all algorithm will kind of spit like a bunch of elements for you. Given this set, now you can compute W3 tilde, right? And all we need to do now is just check something about W3 tilde. 
if the if they are the same, then you know that <coughs> all you need to check for now is is the size of of s report. If s report is less than s, just just return the set. If it's less, more than s, then it's not s sparse, because if they are the same here, s report and s correct are, are like are the same with high probability. So that's the first case. If they are the same, now if they if even these things are not the same. You know that with the vector s, the vector x is not even s sparse. So just report that, <clears throat> and see, and you see that the the space of this final algorithm is just the same as the for all algorithm, and except that you maintain two more numbers. Actually, you just maintain this guy. Okay. Now, so in total, the total space is CK from the for all algorithm plus one. So that's still S times log S over delta. So that's the sketch that you get. This is the size of your sketch. And you can observe that this again is a linear sketch. So you can merge. When you, when you have two streams, you can merge them together. So I kind of mention this linear sketch quite often because you can uh, use it in the homework. It's going to be very useful. OK, questions so far? How is this related to the data stream thing? Good, good. Yeah. So the data stream is this thing, right? Well, you. So remember the the fruit, the fruit basket stuff. You have an update to the to the stream, like like you have this vector x. Given the first, given given the one kind of fruit, you keep updating x one. And you might decreasing x one if you remove the fruit, and you get yeah you you get like given the stream you you keep updating this this vector x, and and here we have what we what do we have if so if until some point there are only s kind of fruit in the basket, then you can actually recover all of that. So that's a um, good question. Yeah, that's not dumb at all. Uh, yeah. Um, about the space. So like in the for all algorithm, um, it says that you maintain the frequency vector of elements in that bucket. Frequency? Say it again, sorry. Uh, in the for all algorithm, yeah. like I'm looking at the notes, it says that you maintain the frequency vector of elements in like each bucket. Yeah. But isn't that frequency vector like? Isn't the total size of all those frequencies like up to n? Oh, very good, very good. So I mean, <clears throat> no, because we actually even in for each here. I think you mean in for each, right? I think it's in both, but yeah. Yeah, like you update this thing, but you don't actually maintain this thing. Good, good point. You, I actually just maintain. The sketch of this this guy. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just yeah, good, 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 good point. I I don't maintain this thing. Just maintain the sketch of of this guy. Okay. Maintain a one sparse recovery sketch of of XP. Explicitly, explicit here. More questions? All right, good. 
So now, um, so I I want to like uh, just to make sure you understand everything. One exercise is this. Mm. So we have seen a spot, like one sparse recovery algorithm from last time. That algorithm is actually deterministic. We just maintain three numbers, and that there's nothing randomized about that. There's no hashing. But in that in that algorithm. If you remember, actually, I use Cauchy-Schwarz. And that case is where I assume that xi is at least 0. That's why it works. So I want you to try to see that you actually can come up with one sparse recovery algorithm that works even when xi can be negative. And actually, you have the tools to do that already. The tools to do that is just to use like kind of the same trick here, the W, the W three that I introduced in in the S sparse recovery. Instead of using W three like before in in one sparse thing, like instead of in one sparse recovery, I use the B three to be this thing, right? I square. That works only when when like all xi is at least zero. Now, we don't want to use this. Try to use this instead, right? And say that if you use this instead, you can still check if the vector is one sparse or not. Um, and, um, but now it's going to be randomized. But yeah, it's, it's, it's good with high probability anyway. So try that. OK, so if you want to learn more about stuff, I put some, I put some reference here. What surprised me the most is that this s pass recovery algorithm can be actually done in the deterministic way. And uh, it uses something called unbalanced expander. Um, and it's a cool object. I think I mentioned this before. But yeah, you can have a look if you want. So now I'm going to look at the new problem. It's going to be somewhat similar. So OK. So here we have the same setting. That is, you have a frequency vector. Um, this thing denotes the frequency vector of the stream. Like you imagine that there is a data stream, data stream that, <coughs> that, like given an, an update, uh, you you can up, up, keep updating this frequency vector. Okay. And now the new problem is this: it's called L zero sampling. We we just want to compute a sketch again. That is of size much less than n. Now it's probably log n. And um, so that from this sketch, you want to be able to uniformly sample a non-zero element in x from the sketch in just polylog time. So. Now that this is quite similar to one sparse recovery, right? For one sparse recovery, like you have a stream, whenever the vector is one sparse, you you can recover that element. Here, it's similar in the sense that you, I, I still want some non-zero entry of x, but here I want it to be uniform. But it, it will work even when x is not sparse at all. For one sparse recovery, it, it will return you an entry if there is only one entry here, if there is only one non-zero entry, for, right? Here, even when x is dense, there are many non-zero entry. It will still return you some, some like sample of non-zero entry of x. So that's the problem. Okay. So. 
let me for now uh, I will just use some notation let the set of non zero just be like the all the index i such that x i is not zero and I use here x naught like norm zero of x but I, I just call x naught um, this is the size of a set of non zero and um, for any set t yeah, if I denote x t yeah, so this x t is a vector still of size n just like x but it's like an x that is restricted to entry in t so that is for any element that is in t I still just use the same number from x but everything outside t I just zero them right so like if this is my x and let's say my t the set t let's say t is just n over 2 so this is my set t so x of t is gonna be just everything here is the same as x the same but everything here is gonna be zero okay. just notation um, make sense uh, like question about notation all right so and just to recall, one sparse recovery can maintain a sketch of size three, such that if if x is one sparse, it will return a non-zero entry of x. Otherwise, then I will report that it's not one sparse. So this is just our notation, but this is our problem. So question before I start describing the algorithm. So let me give the first attempt. So the first attempt would be this. Suppose that I let define a set T just to be a sample like is obtained by, I use this notation to be a set that is obtained by sampling each element in, in N with probability Q. Right. Just sample independently each element in N and put it into this set. And now let's, let me fix T from now. And what we do is that we're gonna just run one sparse recovery on xt. This is my sketch of one sparse recovery, but I do it on xt. So, so if xt is like of xt not is one, then we we will like. There is only one non-zero entry in, in this in this xt. You see that we will get a uniformly random non-zero entry of x. Right? For example, if if I mean how do you say yeah, I mean, it's just that if I just sample each element and um, I only get one non-zero element left in xt, then that element is going to be like a uniformly random non-zero element because the, there is no bias towards any non-zero elements here. Right? I just, t is, t is defined to be just, you know, um, just sample each element uniformly, right? So if, if this guy is one sparse, I will now be done 
I would just get a non-zero, like a uniformly random non-zero element of, of of x. But if it's not one zero, not one sparse, then I can report that it's not one sparse. Okay, so all I need to check now is just like what is the probability that this thing is one sparse? If it is one sparse, then then um, I'm I'm done. Are you with me? So, so suppose that suppose that I know the size of x naught, right? Then what is the value of q that we should choose so that this guy become one? Well, you have that um, in expectation the size of x t naught here. It's just q times uh, x naught, right? Because this is just well, you you have you have these many non-zero elements. Each of them you sample with probability q. You, you sample it into t with probability q. So the number of non-zero in this in this vector is just going to be in expectation. It's going to be q times this thing. So then obviously how we should choose Q is just we should choose Q to be something like inverse of X naught, just so that this thing become one. At least in expectation, things look good that way. And yeah, and now I'm going to make this thing um, formal. That is indeed if let's say that X naught is something around 2 to the K. Like at most to the k minus one, at least to the k minus two. If you if you, suppose you know the value of x naught up to a fact of two, something to be close to the two to the k. Then, if you set t, this set t is a sample from every element in n with probability one over two to the k. Then now I claim that. Um, at least with probab probability at least one eight, then this guy is on sparse. And if this guy is one sparse, then then you're done. It, this algorithm gonna give you this algor this first attempt algorithm gonna give you the um, the uniform random answer element. So let's prove this. Let's prove that this thing is at least one eight. So you have that. What is this? The, the size of x t naught is just the number of the size of the set of non-zero intersect with t. That's that's what we want, want to analyze, and we want to analyze when this is one. Well, <clears throat> this is one if and only if there exists some element which is non-zero, that this guy is picked into T, but everyone else, everyone else like J, that is non-zero but not I, this guy is not picked into T. And now we can just use a union bound instead of x is i, just sum over all i. The probability that i is in this set and every every other j is not in the set. <clears throat> but now you can analyze it. We pick every element into t independently with probability q. Right. So this is going to be q. This is the probability that this thing happened. The probability that each of these things happen is 1 minus q to the size of non zero minus 1. And that's now you can just compute, like calculate. Um, q is said to be 2 to the k. 
and um, there are at least like <coughs> there are at least this many non-zero <coughs> because s is at least two to the k minus two minus two to the k minus one. So because because this thing is between these numbers, then you get you get this thing, and then you calculate a bit, and you get that this is one eight. Okay, doesn't matter too much the calculation, but yeah. So this just confirm confirm our intuition that if you choose um, if you choose each element into this set T, so that this with probability something like one over x naught, then you would get that this guy gonna be one sparse with with one one eight probability. So not too bad prob probability, some constant. Okay. So to conclude, what we have now, that is, if we somehow know x naught approximately within within the factor of two. Then you can get a uniformly random non-zero entry of x with one eight probability, right? Okay. With me? Okay. So now, um, how how would like this is this is strong, right? How how can we know that? How can we know x naught approximately? This is this is not good. We shouldn't know. Like, we don't know it. But it's not a problem. Because you know that okay, we don't know x naught. But there must be some k anyway, such that like x naught is between these two numbers. Right? There must be like x naught is it's gonna be between some power of two. That's that's nothing surprising. So there, and there are just lock n many power of two to try. So just try them all. Just the same algorithm, but try them all for all k. For all k, let t k be a sample from n of probability one over two to the k. And now. You maintain a one sparse recovery of XTK. Yeah. And when you want to query, just try them all. Like look at each of the sketch here. Each if some of them, if some of XTK is one sparse, then you would be able to get a non-zero entry of it. If there are if if this is one sparse for many case, then you will be able, you will be able to get many non-zero elements, but we just need one. So just return one. Okay. So nothing much is going on here. I just said that we don't know x naught, but x naught is gonna be in some power of two. So, so just try them all. That just increases the size by log in. Okay. So what we get so far is that we will be able to obtain a zero element of x with probability at least one over eight, right? Because yet there are, there's going to be just some k such that x naught is between these two numbers, and we said before that when we set t k to be this set. That sample with this prob probability, then this guy gonna be gonna be like if x naught is between these two, then t k will be such that x of t k is one sparse. And if x is of x of t k is one sparse, we we get we just can sample something from it. Yeah. Um. How do we know like what k to go up to? You try them all. Oh. Like, like, um. So, I mean. You know that this guy, x naught, is not going to be more than n. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So, so size of the universe is like pre-known, and so you can just yeah, okay. yeah. 
Yeah, we, we know the size, like we assume that um, the, the, the bound on the size of the universe always, yeah. So this guy is at most n, so there's just sock n, many, many things to try. All right. So far, so good, I hope. So what do we get now? We get an algorithm that with not too bad probability, it will just give you some random element, some random non-zero entry of x. Do you, how can, can, how can I boost this probability to be like really large? Say it again. Like the tighter bound on tie. Like a closer interval for x zero. Oh, closer interval for x zero. Yeah, that's that's one thing. But like, let's say that I want to boost this probability to be like really large, like one minus n to the ten. So. Like more sample or reduce the size of this is gonna like gonna boost the probability a bit, but like I want to like boost it even faster, like exponentially. Uh, is it like the whole copy the algorithm? Maybe? Yeah, yeah. We can do the same trick again and again. We have something that works with constant probability. Make like lock in copies of them. Everything gonna work with high probability. So, like, when you say the sampling thing, um, when is that sampling done? In the beginning. Like, you just sam sample everything from the beginning and fix that set from now. And when when you when the when the and when the the stream is updated, this set is now fixed. Nothing changed about the set. But then, doesn't the sampling process take n log n time? So. Yeah, right now let's say we, we're gonna fix that, but right now let's say we don't care about time. Okay. Yeah, we just want that, the, the thing. Okay, like there are many problems about this set, but um, because you need n time to sample this thing, you also need to store it too. Right. So that sounds like bad, but we're gonna fix that later. So yeah, you, you anticip anticipate the problem, but yeah. But we're gonna fix any, everything about the set later. So now, yeah. How can we boost the probability to from one over eight to something really big, like re really close to one? We just make copies of everything. So now the prob probability that all of them fail that like that that we cannot get like uh, this guy with probability one over eight. Each of them fail. It's gonna be at most seven over eight to the to the number number of copies. So that's like really small. Okay, and that lead us to the last issue, right? We we sample this set. We need to spend time on it. We need to store it too, that's more important. We now can kind of care about space. We need to store this set to that text in space. So what's like, that's, that's very wasteful. Like we try a lot, but now the point, but the thing is that we, there is a way to represent all this set using very small space. And that's, again, we're gonna use hash function. So hash function gonna, gonna be, like, we can use hash function to represent all this set implicitly using very small space. So let me present the whole algorithm, the final algorithm. So the final algorithm is here. First, we're just gonna make copies of everything below. 
log n of them. Now, instead of sample a set t, tk in a way that we did, like sample everything independently and get tk, what I'm going to do is I choose a function h. And this function, I just need to be, need it to be pairwise independent. Okay. If you recall, like, pairwise independent is stronger than universal. Um, <coughs> the probability of it is that this probability that it maps to anything j equals beta, this is n square. This is the probability of pairwise independent. And you can construct like so, so I think like I think um, in the you have seen this in the discussion, right? Um, session that how to construct pairwise independent hash function. Okay, good. Like you need not too many bits to, to represent this guy. So it takes like one way to present this guy is like you can use just two numbers, that enough to um, but but think of it as it takes really small space to represent it. Two number would be enough. So that just just one hash function that you just need to remember. And now what I'm gonna do is just for each k here, I set t k to be all i such that the value of hash function is less than n over two to the k. So that's my, my set tk. It's now different from before. So this is the new part. But now everything else is the same. When you give it an update, you just for each k, just maintain one sparse recovery of xtk. Uh, when, you when you query, just return non-zero entry of, of xtk if this guy is one sparse. And if, when you query, if the algorithm returns several non-zero, just return one of them. That's what we need. Okay. Question about the algorithm before we analyze it. All right. You have some? Okay, good. So let's analyze the space, right? Before, like first of all, it, it shouldn't be clear to you that this is correct. Like we change the algorithm instead of sample each set uh, independently, we, we we define the set in the very new way. Uh, why it still works, right? Um, that's not clear, but we're gonna prove this later. Let's at least see that everything is efficient right now. So let's analyze the resource. So there are C mini copies. Let's log in. For each copy, there are K mini level. For each level, you create one sparse recovery sketch. So that takes three numbers. So the total numbers that you need is something like three CK. So that's Log square in. And note again that this sketch is, is a linear sketch again because it's re really just a bunch of one sparse recovery sketch. And each of them is, each of one sparse recovery is linear. How about the additional space that you use for the hash functions? There are C mini copies, and each copy. This pairwise independent hat function just need like constant numbers, just two numbers. So that's like log in numbers. So this is a sketch that you put in array. So that just this is of size log square. And in that in addition to, to the sketch, like 
the, the space that you need to use for hash function, which define the, fu the, sketch, the function sketch itself, that is small. So now, what is left is just correctness. So what we need to show is here, right? Kind of similar to the, the lemma that we have before. If x0 is between something like 2 to the k, close to the 2 to the k, then I claim that if you choose t, k, in this way, the way that we def do it, the way that we do in the final algorithm, then at least this thing is still true. This guy is still going to be one sparse. XTK is still going to be one sparse. Before we have that when TK is obtained by sampling every element in N with probability one over two to the K, then this is true. Now TK is defined in a new way. I can assure that this is still the case. <laughs> And you see, if this is true, then everything else follow in the same way, right? Um, <coughs> like, if this is true, then you know that, okay, for each copy of the algorithm, there is one K that you can re return with, with one eight probability. So now you have log eight mini copies, some of them gonna return with high probability. <coughs> so I, I just need to prove this. And now, um, so what's the challenge? The challenge is that why, let's say, why does the old proof does not work? Why, why the old proof not work? This is because you see, like in our previous analysis, right? We use this thing, like we, we analyze that the, the probability that i is picked into t and everything else, every, like, everything else which is non-zero is not picked into t, this is like this stuff. But this, is, this calculation really exploits that every element are independent. Like every element is sampled into t independently. That's why you can just multiply the probability together. This really use independence. It use n wise independence. Right? Every elements are independent from each other. But here we don't have n wise independent. We just have pair wise independence. So we need basically a new analysis that only exploit pair wise independent. And um, The calculation that I'm going to show next is just a bit long, but nothing. There's nothing scary about it. It's just long calculation. <laughs> but let's see, but step by step. Okay. We we what we want to analyze this thing. Right. This is just the same as the probability that the size of T K intersect non-zero, set of non-zero, is one. So that's just same thing as the probability that the exist i, which is not zero, and i is in tk, and but j is not in tk for all j for every other non-zero element which is not i. And then I just use union bound to get the sum instead of x is. Okay. And then get here. And now, from here, I just use this thing, which is the probability that a and b happen is probability of b times probability of b given A. So this is always, tr always true. 
if you if a and b are independent then you wouldn't have this thing you just give you just get like probably of a times probably of b but these are like in general you you need this thing so so now i just write this times this thing given the first event okay this is for all and now instead of writing for all of this this is just the same thing as one minus like i asked what is the probability that for all j which is not i j is not in the set this is just the same thing as one minus exists some j, j is in the set, right? Just this thing is one minus probability of not a. Okay. And we can use union bound here because there is exist. Just put the like this is this is at most the sum of the sum of this probability. So I just put sum over all j, which is not i, and this probability. And now, let's just write down what it means by i be, being in k, in tk, j is in tk. This is just saying that, this is just the same. The condition whether each element is in the set or not is just whether the, the hash value is at most n over 2 to the k. Right. So this is just the definition of the hash of whether why when when the element is in the set. And do we did everything here just so that we have the following step. Now you see that everything here you have done, and now you see that this is this is just an expression that depends only on two two entries, two keys, right? And so now, because this depends on just two keys of the hash function, by pairwise independent, you get that this is the same as, oh, this should be J, sorry. J. Given that you know something about I, it doesn't tell you anything about J. This is by pairwise independent. And now you can calculate the probability. Everyone with me up to this point? OK. And now you can calculate, like, what is the probability that h of i is at most n over 2 to the k? Because this hash function is pairwise independent, it must be uniform as well. Pairwise independent means that it's one wise independent, which means it's, 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 it's uniform. You can check that. Because this is uniform, so there are like the range of the range of h is n. There are like uh, this many possible numbers here n over 2 to the k. So the probability that this guy fall into this like 1 over 2 to the k fraction of the range is just 1 over 2 to the k. Right. The same here, this thing is at most, this is just 1 over 2 to the k. And then you sum over everything, you get this. And now because um, this thing is basically close to the, to the k, so you can calculate, and you get 108. So, we get what we want. And that means that the final algorithm works fine, even if you use pairwise hash function. Okay, now let me just 
before I finish, let me just ask you some questions. Um, this just to test your un the understanding. It's not, it's maybe non trivial, but yeah, let's see. So, what is wrong with this statement? Um, if you have a vector of size n, and if I sample n log n, like if I sample independently n log n many entry of x, then like just sample an entry independent, and if I just sample an entry of x independently this many times, n log n times, then you know that each of the entry will be sampled once. Just just by coupon collector. It's in your homework, right? I think. No? Is it, but like with high probability, right? With high probability, yeah. OK. Now, nothing is going on here. I just said that if I sample each entry, like if I sample n log n times, I'm going to sample some entry of x at least once. A every entry of x at least once. <coughs> with high prob probability. Now, suppose instead of that I have this L0 sampler. This is a sketch of size just log square. What if I said that I want to sample non-zero entry of x this many times? Can I just reconstruct x from this, from this sketch? Because if I can, it means that I can compress vector of size n to just a vector of size n square. So what what's wrong? What what's going on? Okay. I think the algorithm is deterministic after you pick the initial hash function. So if you use the same sampler over and over you're not going to get different entries. You actually need to use different samplers each time. And then initializing each sampler takes like some extra time. And so you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More, more ideas? You again agree with Aditya? Yeah. yeah. You're Aditya, right? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Just as a question, are the samples dependent on each other? Yeah. So yeah, that's that's the thing, right? Yeah. So both both of you basically are right. Like this thing works because each of the samples are independent. But if I if I have this sketch, I sample once, I get something uniform. If I sample again, actually you will get the same thing. So each sample will not be independent. So it's not like you can compress a vector of size n to it, log square. So yeah, each sketch, just like what Aditya said, once you fix the hash function, everything is deterministic. When you sample, once you get, you keep getting the same thing. So it basically just gives you one sample, one uniform sample. So, but the coupon collector works only when this, all of these samples are independent. Okay, good. So now, like, so you see a bunch of, a bunch of uh, streaming algorithm, and um, next time we're gonna see how this streaming algorithm can be useful for graph algorithm. Like, you can use it to to get uh, distributed graph algorithm. So that's that's gonna be quite cool and yeah. Um, any question before we stop? Uh, about the time complexity of this, um, isn't you need like log squared n time per update, right? Yeah. Okay. Is that kind of slow? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what is the best known though. Yeah. Um, I think the space, the space complexity, uh, is is optimal here. I don't know if you can com 
improve the time. Yeah. Good. All right, and uh, see you next week. Yeah.